and then Valman have done some very interesting studies on this this last year. Just go to the middle paragraph. Art programs have fostered sustained meaningful interaction between groups and content through facilitating community dialogues with a clear plan for success at the end of the program, which shown to contribute to trust and reductions in violence. That's a finding which I think we have to hold on to. So the more we can talk with each other, the more we can open up dialogical conversations, the more we can, the more we can overcome those boundaries of difference, uh, the better it will be for all of us. In terms of uh, national ideology, the critical question there is what sort of institutions and mechanisms do we need to control negative ideologies and xenophobic nationalism? You know, it's astonishing how hard it is to be cosmopolitan in the 21st century um, in the face of, you know, the, national, the new nationalist search. Um, you know, it's, 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 it's almost traitorous in America to kind of say that you're a cosmopolitan and you're in favor of the United Nations uh, when most, you know, when the people that support Donald Trump are wanting to make America great again. So we've got to figure out cosmopolitan counter-narratives which are going to be as exciting and as interesting and enticing to people as xenophobic nationalist ones. And that's something that I can't understand. I thought that, you know, in the, in the end of the 20th century, in the beginning of this century, after the end of the Cold War, we'd move beyond nationalism and we might be on to regionalism and globalism and something much more exciting. Uh, but no, nationalism's reared its ugly 19th century ahead and we're dealing with it again. Secondly, we need to develop peace education programs, uh, collaborative, that, 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 that you know, introduce students and others to the way in which we can solve problems together, because none of us are going to be able to solve problems alone. You know, and I, and I keep on talking, you know, my, my inaugural lecture 10 years ago had to do with the politics of compassion. Um, and I could have just given the same lecture because that's where we are. How do we, how do we, how do we ensure that we're building mutuality across all the boundaries of difference um, that exist around us? How do, we, how do we stretch out and communicate with those we don't normally communicate with? And what's the role of peace education in this? We also need to pay much more attention to human rights education and social justice programs. You know, in the, in the 70s, 80s, 90s, and, and noughties, we were all, you know, human rights was right up there. But now, who's promoting human rights at the international level? Who's promoting human rights here in New Zealand? Who's promoting civil liberties? Who's, who's really kind of focusing attention on the way in which the, the new state systems with their extraordinary surveillance capacities are creating opportunities where we have no privacy, where we have where, where our individual liberty is really going to be um, uh, be given or taken away on behalf of the state system. There's a wonderful new book called Surveillance Capitalism, which shows that you know, we're we're all being commodified in very different ways, um, you know, by the internet um, and by cyberspace, um, and that's having really important kind of um, effects, negative effects on human rights. How do we really promote economic reform, justice, and fair trade? And what sort of institution and groups do we need to do that? And most importantly of all, in relation to the current crisis, we need to reinforce and, and expand the numbers of inter and religious dialogues of relevant religious actors. In terms of the final one, global um, exchanges, challenges, and exchange and exchanges. Um, you know, how do we reduce the unpredictability and global turbulence uh, that, that confronts us every, every day I wake up, and you know, I, I really should be putting on the concert program and listening to music. Mm -hmm. Every day you wake up and there's another reason for anxiety. Um, you know, we, you know, we've now been told that, you know, we're way beyond the point of no return in relation to global change, climate change. We're way beyond the point of no return in relation to our seas and our environment. Um, uh, and this generates a very existential anxiety that you know, all of us are grappling with right now. So how do we produce more pre uh, predictability? How do we promote preventive diplomacy? And how do we develop rule-based global institutions? And how do we revive active interests in the United Nations? Um, and how do we begin thinking of ourselves as global citizens? Um, well, one way we can do that is by welcoming migrants and refugees. We should be putting a, a signpost on, on the uh, you know, on our national um, um, web websites and so forth, saying, you know, New Zealand welcomes migrants and refugees. We welcome those who can't make a living elsewhere. We want, we want you to come 
and we want to provide hospitality to you. We've got to figure out ways in which we can stop and slow the flow of weapons to state and non-state actors. That was a wonderful move that uh, the government and, and the opposition made to um, at least control some weapons in New Zealand. You know, that these weapons create the tools whereby we can express our malevolence. And we need to work to kind of establish what we call complex sensitive journalism to address complexity in the root causes of conflict and information to manage fear. Um, you know, because, we're, because we're confronted with a lot of fear at the moment and we, and, and, and we don't know, you know how, to, how to deal with it, uh, how to deal with the issues that are being put before us. And then most important of all is how do we prevent, mitigate and adapt to climate change, which is the biggest existential threat. So in all of this, and I'm nearly at the end, so we've got plenty of time for, for conversation, how do we minimize the securitized responses to mass murder and maximize the non-violent? If we, if, to give these non-violent solutions a chance, it's vital that we don't move to a permanently armed police, that we don't rely, ask the government to rely on increased surveillance and security, that is, that we, and all of the security that's currently directed towards Muslims uh, added to with directly surveillance directed towards uh, white supremacists. Uh, and it's important that we don't think that the best response to extremist behavior is coercive activity. I hope I've said enough to say that you know, the best, our best chance for creating a non-violent, peaceful, harmonious anti-hero in New Zealand is by doing it from the community level, from the grassroots upwards, uh, rather than top down. There will be no permanent peace if we're relying on states to deliver it, because state, the logic of the state is that the state is moving towards higher and higher levels of security, control, and domination. And they're precisely uh, the attributes that we want to avoid if we're going to create a truly emancipatory community, society, and system for ourselves. There's a need to be reassuring and prudent on safety. People are afraid at the moment. Um, you know, when, when uh, you know, I've had some very strange experiences in, in recent weeks with you know, people photographing me through my, my office window. Um, and, you know, and, and you suddenly get these anxiety attacks. You know, well, what's this for? I'm not the clock tower. Um, so there's a need for us to be reassuring and prudent on safety, but it's also vital that, that government and civil society build on widely held values of tolerance, decency, and fair go. And that we look for community institutions and strengths that are explicitly non-violent and reassuring. This is a moment for non-violent behavior, a moment for asserting the role of non-violence, the role of pacifism, the role of, of, um, of, of humility, the role of respect, the role of dignity in creating the kinds of communities that we want to be a part of. And it's certainly not a moment for thinking of revenge. Uh, and you know, I, you know, one of the things which I, I think we all have to be extraordinarily grateful for is that our Muslim brothers and sisters and their leaders um, have, ex have, have demonstrated to those of us of a Judeo-Christian persuasion something about the true nature of forgiveness. Yeah. You know, it takes so much um, power, you know, power and, and courage to stand up if your uh, partner's just been shot and to say, I, fear no, I, I hold no malice towards the perpetrator and I, hold, I, and I forgive that person, which is what happened. This, this is, you know, huge. Um, they are teaching us, you know, the, who, 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 whose theology is based on love and forgiveness and reconciliation, all that we need to know about love, forgiveness and reconciliation. And I want to finish with my normal uh, Seamus Heaney, thinking beyond revenge. She said, human beings suffer, they torture one another, they get hurt and get hard. No poem or play or song can fully right a wrong, inflicted and endured. The innocent in jails beat on their bars together. A hunger striker's father stands in the graveyard dumb. The police widow in veils faints at the funeral home. History says, don't hope on this side of the grave. But then once in a lifetime, the long-fought tidal wave of justice can rise up. And hope in history can rise. So hope for a great sea change on the far side of revenge. Believe that a further shore is reachable from here. Believe in miracles and cures and healing wells. And believe in the power of nonviolence 
to get us over this particular hump uh, in our history. <coughs> Otherwise, uh, you know, being positive and, and giving us grounds for optimism. Thank you.